I'm Natasha Kierczek, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, an Israeli man is stabbed in a terror attack in Gush Etzion. Israeli airstrikes are reported in Syria. And we hope you're ready to shop until you drop because it looks like Walmart is heading to the Holy Land. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. For the first time in history, Saudi Arabia is allowing flights headed to Israel to fly over its airspace. This is the first real example of warming ties between Saudi Arabia and Israel and is the welcomed result of both Prime Minister Netanyahu's recent trip to India last month and Air India's insistence. Currently, the only direct flights to and from India from Israel are run by El Al, but because of the detour around the Saudi Kingdom, the trip typically takes about eight hours. Air India's newly approved New Delhi to Tel Aviv route will take less than six hours and will undoubtedly be cheaper as well. With at least three hours less spent in the air, that means less fuel and more savings that will likely be passed on to consumers. Air India has already been in contact with the Israeli airport authority and is expected to gain approval to open flights for booking as soon as March 20th. But for passengers hoping to stay on El Al, don't expect the prices to drop for you just yet. The Saudi overflight airspace privileges have not yet been extended to the Israeli flagship carrier. All right, another brutal stabbing attack has been reported near Jewish homes in the West Bank. The victim is a 34-year-old Israeli man who was working as a civilian security guard at the entrance of the Kalmetsul settlement near Hebron. A uh, Palestinian terrorist uh, tried to attack and stab a guard in the entrance to Kalmetsul, which is in a, a residence in Gush Etzion. Uh, the guards... Um, shot the attacker and the, he was killed. Israeli security forces tracked down the suspect's family to the nearby Palestinian city of Halkhul for interrogations. Riots quickly broke out around the family's home, however, prompting the army to use crowd dispersal measures. One of the rioters was arrested in the clashes, and this stabbing comes less than 48 hours after another similar attack in the West Bank settlement of Ariel. That suspect, a 19-year-old Arab Israeli who once lived in Yafo, is still at large and is a prime suspect for the murder of Rabbi Itamar ben Gal. Thousands have just gathered to mourn the death of Rabbi Itamar ben Gal, the 29-year-old father of four who was murdered by Palestinian terrorists in the West Bank earlier this week. Israelis from all over the country convened in the rabbi's community of Har Bracha. This tragic murder was felt all over the country, made even more painful by the fact that the rabbi's suspected murderer, a teenage Arab Israeli who lived in Yafo, is still at large. In an ironic, if symbolic, twist, Palestinians were actually burying one of their own just a few days earlier, not so far away in the Palestinian city of Jenin. Hundreds, if not thousands, marched in the streets to mourn the death of a 19-year-old Palestinian teenager who had been apparently been shot dead by Israeli troops. The incident occurred during an IDF raid in the West Bank, pursuing suspects related to last month's murder of Rabbi Ghazel Shevach. The victim was one of hundreds of rioters protesting the army's presence. The IDF says they had used only non-fatal riot dispersal means to break up the crowd, but the Palestinian Health Ministry says the man was killed by a gunshot to the head. Well, Syria has just accused Israel of launching a wave of airstrikes on a military outpost just outside of Damascus. Though the Syrian army claims to have deflected all of the attacks, other sources say at least some missiles did hit their targets. And the site in question is linked to a key research center believed to be producing chemical weapons. Though Israel has neither confirmed nor denied this attack, the IDF is believed to have launched dozens of airstrikes against Syrian targets over the last few years. This, coupled with growing tensions with Israel's other neighbor to the north, Lebanon, has sparked growing anxiety about a possible incoming war. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has actually just visited the northern border to issue a threat to Israel's enemies. עם חברי הקבינט. אני מתרשם מהעבודה הגדולה שצה"ל עושה כאן להגן על גבולותינו, להגן על מדינתנו. פנינו לשלום, 
אבל אנחנו ערוכים לכל תרחיש. But top Lebanese leaders have also recently convened as well to accuse Israel of infringing on Lebanese territory with its border wall project. Indeed, many say the preliminary wall does seem to cross the UN's demarcated border line and breach into Lebanese territory. But Israel disputes this, saying that the wall will only be built on Israel's side of the border. In glaring contrast to most other nations in the region, Israel has openly shown support for an independent Kurdistan. Well, the Kurdish referendum was voted down, but the fight's not over yet. And joining us now with more is Dr. Nimam Gafori, the founder of the nonprofit organization Joint Help for Kurdistan. Thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Thank you for having me here. Now, I'd like you to start by telling us your story. Well, I'm a refugee child. I was born in a cave where well, uh, my hometown was uh, bombed and then later uh, was refugee in Iran and then later on Sweden. In Sweden, I uh, studied uh, medicine and became cardiac surgeon. And for the last uh, four years, I've been volunteering in Kurdistan and wow. helping um, IDPs, in the, uh, internal displaced people and refugees, which is uh, those uh, victims of war who have cross the international borders. So a cardiac surgeon and uh, a humanitarian. So, so, I mean, why is it so important that there is a Kurdish state? Well, uh, you know, because this is the only way we have, uh, we, we see that we, have, we, we would be able to be respected by others. And we have seen the experience of failure of Baghdad governing, you know, the so-called sovereignty of Iraq. Again and again, after so many times, we have seen those, you know, uh, regimes in Baghdad when they are weak, they are friends with Kurds. The uh, second they get, uh, you know, a little bit more power, they uh, turn the guns towards Kurds, what, which we saw with Abadi, you know. The so, so, so tell us why you're here in Israel today. Well, I, I'm here really for um, uh, strengthening the humanitarian bridge between Kurdistan and Israel and uh, try to uh, move the Jewish-Kurdish community here uh, to support uh, people in Kurdistan, civilian people, uh, people who have been really forgotten by uh, the big organizations. Well, and I think it's very interesting because like we said before, Israel is really one of the only nations that is supporting an independent Kurdistan, uh, which is very much in contrast to the Turks, Iraqis, Iranians, Syrians. Um, they've all rejected the most recent re referendum for an independent Kurdistan. So, um, well, you know, it was a referendum in Kurdistan that became excuse for, uh, you know, the central government mm -hmm. and the neighboring country to attack them. But in Afrin, they, there wasn't any election or referendum. Yet, they have been uh, attacking civilian people in yeah. Afrin and uh, there is a genocide going on now, you know, and they have allowed Turkey to enter Syria. And for Syria, they don't talk about sovereignty of the country. So Turkey can come in. But in Iraq, you know, because of the oil, they have been trying to uh, keep it as it is, which is too big difference between, you know, the Kurdistan part and the rest of Iraq. All right. Well, they, what I, I would, because unfortunately we are running out of time, but I, I would like to know for those people who are interested in working with you and joining your cause, what can they do? Well, they can, uh, we really need uh, economic support. For example, for a generator, we don't have the money to buy t to run the clinic that uh, treating 2,500 people per month. So we will be happy if anybody uh, or any organization wants to, you know, uh, give a helping hand for people in the camps in Kurdistan, both in Iraqi Kurdistan and Syrian Kurdistan. And they can go to medicine. your website for more information about that, which is? And joint, um, joint Health uh, Kurdistan .org, joint or Kurdistan the Facebook, org. which is Joint Health for Kurdistan, that we are updating daily from what's going on uh, for people in the camps, okay. displaced people. All right, thank you so much for thank joining you. us, doctor. Thank you so much. All right, the Israeli government has just informed nearly 20,000 asylum seekers from Africa that they will be jailed indefinitely if they don't agree to be deported to a third party unnamed country in Africa. But the majority of asylum seekers seem to agree that they'll far sooner choose jail over the likely dangers that await them if they were to be deported. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here with more on this. So Aaron, these people are, are just waiting for jail now. That is essentially what is happening. Well, they're accepting the, the fact that jail is better than being deported to some unnamed country where they don't know what their status will be mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, but that, that being said, you know, that doesn't mean that they're 
taking this without a fight. In fact, there was a massive protest just outside the Rwandan uh, right. embassy in uh, in Hertelia. Well, and we're day. seeing we're seeing we're seeing uh, certainly a surge of outrage um, over what mm -hmm. is happening. But we also are seeing recent polls um, that come out showing that two thirds of Israelis support these deportations, right? So, so that poll is true. That's that's true. Two thirds of Israelis were polled and uh, and said that they support the deportations. However. The basis for their, uh, in, you know, why they want to deport people is because they think that crime rates are, are very high among the asylum-seeking population, which is a fact that's been largely debunked by even the Israeli police. Right. And what is that statistic, that 40% of um, crime within yeah, South for, Tel Aviv... Yeah, 40% of crime in South Tel Aviv is perpetuated is, by, right. by the refugees or the asylum seekers, but they make up over 70% 70 of, yeah. of the population. Now, that being said, there's also the other third of the mm -hmm. population that is uh, offering to, uh, many of which are opting to illegally house and shelter a lot of these refugees. The problem with that is that if these people are found out, they face criminal charges and the people that they're sheltering are likely going to be deported anyway. Now, as for fighting in a legal battle, uh, the fight is also, again, being taken back to the Israeli High Court of Justice, which has recently found that these deportations do not meet the legal standards either for Israel or internationally. Yeah. Uh, and, and which is something that we've obviously discussed many times. Which is something we've um, discussed, and it's also something that apparently the Likud even knows. Uh, a recently leaked recording from a Likud meeting earlier this week shows that Deputy Foreign Minister Otovelli actually came and announced to the Likud meeting that uh, they know that according to international law, they have to guarantee the safety of these uh, asylum seekers after their deportation, but that, quote, uh, we have no way to keep track of people who go there. If they reach Rwanda or Uganda, it doesn't matter. We have no way to follow them. Right, which is a huge issue given some of the humanitarian... Uh, right. Well, the reports that are coming out saying what is happening to these exactly. refugees that are being sent to both Rwanda and Uganda. This controversial deportation plan is set to begin starting on April 1st, and though only single men are said to be targeted for now, Israeli leaders have made it clear that married men, women, and children will be targeted as well in the future waves. Netanyahu's government has branded this community as, quote, illegal infiltrators, but the vast majority, mostly Christians from Eritrea and Sudan, say they fled war, genocide, and or indefinite mandatory service in a slave army for a better life in Israel. And indeed, nearly 90% of Eritreans, at least, are accepted as legal refugees all over the world. As of today, Israel has granted refugee status to less than 0.07% of asylum seekers living in the country and countless stories of abduction, human trafficking, and worse, tend to surround Africans who have been deported back to Africa in the past, namely Rwanda and Uganda, where most believe Israel will be deporting to. That's why asylum seekers now say that they'll take jail rather than gamble with their lives and their families' lives in Rwanda, Uganda, or wherever else that they may end up. The Trump administration's decision to cut nearly half of its funds to the United Nations Agency for Palestinian Refugees has brought the agency to the brink of crisis. UNRWA is the primary source of aid for over 5 million Palestinian refugees all over the Middle East, a burden shouldered mostly by Jordan, where over 2 million Palestinians currently live. UNRWA's spokesperson in Jordan says the aid cuts have made the situation incredibly dire for these refugees, many of whom still live in refugee camps and are dependent on air, water and food from the United Nations. <laughs> في تاريخ الأنروا وعلى أساسها تم اتخاذ بعض من القرارات أهمها قرارات تقشفية طالت النفقات الإدارية بالإضافة إلى بعض من زملائنا الذين يعملون على عقود المياومة بموازاة ذلك تعمل الأنروا جاهدة في إقليم الأردن على استمرار تقديم الخدمات لاثنين مليون ومئتين ألف لاجئ مقيمين على أرض الأردن دون التأثير على الخدمات الأساسية Despite international outrage, Israeli leaders have largely hailed Trump's controversial decision to slash its aid. Israel has long accused UNRWA of shielding terrorists and shares U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley's view that the agency should divert its resources. But with Palestinian refugees scattered all over Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories as well, the pressure may be mounting on multiple fronts. U.N. officials say Gaza is on the brink of collapse and Hamas itself has announced that a new war with Israel may be only days away. Poland's president has just signed the country's controversial Holocaust bill officially into law. That means people can now be fined or even face jail time for using the words Polish death camp to describe Nazi concentration camps in Poland, including Auschwitz. 
ale jednocześnie, ponieważ jest dla mnie niezwykle ważna ta wrażliwość, ta właśnie, która powoduje te głosy sprzeciwu, ta właśnie, która wywołuje te obawy o to, że nie będzie można głosić prawdy, o to, że będzie zamykanie ust tym, którzy ocaleli. Zdecydowałem się skierować tą ustawę w trybie następczym do Trybunału Konstytucyjnego po to, aby Trybunał Konstytucyjny zbadał zgodność z Konstytucją. This move has only fanned the flames of outrage that began when the bill was first announced, which in a bitter, if poorly timed move, happened to coincide with the World Holocaust Remembrance Day. That ceremony was conducted outside the very gates of Auschwitz. The Polish government had initially promised to work with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu on amending this bill before it became law. But clearly that has not happened. There was a glimpse of hope that the bill would be amended before the president signed it, and yesterday he said he would first send it to Poland's constitution tribunal courts for review. But hours later, he went ahead and apparently signed the current version anyway. Critics all over the world say this new law dangerously rewrites a dark chapter in human history by underplaying the role many Poles played in helping Hitler's final solution. Poland says the law is necessary to curb slander against their country, pointing out that the word Auschwitz isn't Polish. This unfortunately isn't the first country to pass legislation like this. Lithuania, Latvia and Ukraine all have laws that criminalize even discussing the role those countries played in helping the Nazis. As international boycott efforts try to isolate Israel more and more from the world, Israel advocates are fighting back. Joining us now in the studio to explain how is attorney Tamir Dayan, the CEO of the Tel Aviv Convention Center. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. All right, so Tamir, tell me a little bit about the Convention Center. The Convention Center is one of the biggest and largest venues in Israel. And we hold more than 200, 300 conferences a year. We uh, have more than 3 million people and visitors every year, and we are uh, the biggest, the oldest, and one of the most amusing, amazing and beautiful places in Tel Aviv and in Israel. So, so why did you create it, and, and how is the center combating BDS, right? I didn't create it. I was appointed to be the CEO okay. of this, con this convention a year ago. Why was and it created? <laughs> it was created to, to gather people from all around yeah. the world and have con conventions and exhibitions in Israel and be a place where business tourism and people come to uh, join each other, exchange information, exchange ideas, and, 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 and have a good experience. And, and I understand that um, BDS is one of the, the main focuses of the center, right? What, how are you combating BDS? There are thousands of events and exhibitions and conferences and conventions all around the world. Mm -hmm. We are, we, one of our, my main goals is to bring Tel Aviv and to bring our venue to be relevant as a, a potential competitors to venues all around the world. Okay. All this business tourism that gather in, in, in London, in Paris, and in Vienna could gather here. And when people and business people, physicians, cardiologists, pharmaceutical industry will come to Israel and will come to Tel Aviv and do their conventions here, this will prove by actions that Israel could not be undermined by the BDS because it is equally as any other country in Europe. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about the center. Thank you very much. All right. Israelis never turn down a good deal, right down to the last shekel. And that's why the country is practically doing backflips over today's news. It looks like international retailer Walmart is sending representatives to Israel in just a few weeks. And that's right, my friends. The first ever local Walmart store might very well be on its way to the Holy Land. Walmart has neither confirmed nor denied the news so far, but considering the announcement comes from Israel's own National Economic Council chairman, I'd say things are looking pretty firm. The Walmart delegation will reportedly be looking into opening the first ever local Israeli branch of the mega chain store, as well as investigating Israeli cyber innovations to boost Walmart's e-commerce game. That makes a lot of sense, actually, because just a few months ago, Walmart's biggest rival, a little company called Amazon, announced plans to set up warehouses and local operations here in Israel. Those talks are still just speculation, but if it works out, Amazon is prepared to lease nearly 270,000 square feet of Israeli warehouse space. So clearly, Walmart sees the writing on the wall. On top of that, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu actually met one-on-one -on -one last month with the CEO and president of Sam's Club, Walmart's price club-style membership club. Israeli economists are eager that landing Walmart and Amazon as onshore retailers will tremendously boost the local market. Israelis, of course, are mostly just excited to save a buck or two. 
Following the success of Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies of all sorts have begun popping up. Well, if you're one of the millions now investing in these new digital dollars, listen up, because my next guest has something for you. Joining me now in the studio is CEO and co-founder of Altcoin Consultant, Ori David Simanto. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, so what exactly does Altcoin Consultant do? So uh, actually, we developed, Altcoin Consultant developed a... Uh, prognostic solution for smart investment in the cryptocurrency market. Okay, so tell us about that. How does that work? So uh, actually, it's, we started uh, a year ago to trade and we very fast recognized two main barriers between large capital uh, of private investors mm -hmm. and financial institutions and the cryptocurrency market. The first one was the security right. and the second one was the vo the volatility, of course, of the market. Now, so. with, with which cryptocurrencies or alt currencies is your program working? Uh, we analyze more than 200 uh, cryptocurrencies at every second. We gather... And not everybody um, knows there are even so many no, different types, there right? There are even a lot more, All we hear about is Bitcoin me, right now. But we're trying to mm -hmm. focus on those who generate the maximum profit yeah. and who generates minimum expose of volatility of the coins, of course. Interesting. Now, um, you're obviously not the only company that uh, is tracking cryptocurrency. What sets you guys apart? Uh, I think what's, what's uh, unique about us is the problem we're trying to solve. Well, uh, we're first of all focusing on those two barriers that I just said, yeah. which is giving the, the, giving the capital security and minimum exposure to the volatility, the uncertainty actually. Yeah. And uh, what happens is our algorithm is designed in that way that we first of all think on those two components and then we think about how we maximize our profit. So we literally give almost 100% certainty because we hedge all our investments every time. Very interesting. All right, well for those of our viewers who are interested in signing up for Altcoin, what do they do? Again, I'm they sorry. go to your website if they want to ah, sign up of for Altcoin. Yeah. yeah, so you go to our website. We over there now in a better period, which we bring for free exposure to our output uh, algorithm, and uh, we're currently in a seed round, so a lot of things are coming up together. Perfect. All right. Well, check them out, my friends. Thank you for joining Thank us. Thank you very much for having me. All right, even if you don't know her by name, you've probably seen Israeli fashion designer Lia Kes's amazing clothes. Born and raised in Kibbutz Afikim, Kes has dressed some of the biggest celebrities in the world, including Rihanna and Kim Kardashian. And now for the first time ever, her new collection has been announced on the official calendar for New York Fashion Week. Kess learned how to stitch, sew, and style growing up on a kibbutz, the small socialist communities that sprang up in the early days before the state of Israel, and continue until today. That's where she met her mentor, a Holocaust survivor who taught her everything she needed to know to become a world-famous fashion icon. Well, now, decades later, she's certainly making her mentor proud. Known for her delicately washed silks, Kess's new lineup has just been set for the upcoming New York Fashion Week. This will actually be her second showing at Fashion Week, but her first time on the official calendar. Last year, Vogue magazine did a huge write-up on Kess's work, praising her growing ambitions as an artist. We can't wait to see what she has in store this year, and luckily Fashion Week kicks off tomorrow, so we won't have to wait. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Whether or not you care about it, what you wear can end up being a reflection of your attitude and personality. So today's word is signon, which means style in Hebrew. Now, we recommend watching our show Israel in Signon or Israel in Style if you need some tips. But the most important thing about what you wear is making sure it fits who you are. I believe that Signon is something that each of us already has. All we need to do is just find it. Now, just make sure the right person is helping you figure out your personal signon because you wouldn't want to end up without any signon at all. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy with a low of 56 or 13 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow, you can expect an additional rise in temperatures to a high of 78 or 26 degrees Celsius as the winter heat wave is set to continue. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.49 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchak and thanks for watching.